I mean, like famously, Aquinas is like, we can't prove the Trinity from reason alone. And it seems like Scotus is like, yeah, I, I agree. But here's some triple primacy stuff. And then he's like, well, divine love unites them all. Yeah. Right. So, so it's like, well, is this an argument for the Trinity? Like, what? what, what no. Okay. Oh. No. <laughs> Hey, welcome back to another episode of Parker's Pensies. I'm your host, Parker Sedecase, and this is a podcast where we explore all the deepest ideas in philosophy, theology, nature, and life. I love thinking about cool stuff, so come think with me. Today's episode is another very special one. I have with me a very special guest. I believe it's his third time on the podcast. I'm going to be talking with Dr. Tom Ward, uh, and we're going to be talking about his new book on John Dunn Scotus, called Ordered by Love, an Introduction to... John, Don Scotus. It's awesome. If you guys don't know about Scotus, you're in for a treat. If you do know about Scotus, you're in for a treat and maybe a, a good old fashioned triggering. If you were hardcore uh, Thomist, we'll see about that. But uh, I'm really excited about it. We're going to be talking all over the place, but uh, maybe, like existence of God stuff. What the heck is a hexaity? Um, maybe university and analogy, primordial sin. It's all good stuff. I'm really excited to talk about it. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Ward is a is a philosopher and uh, you know a historian now of John Scott Don Scotus, which is awesome. So we're gonna be all the map. You're gonna be an expert by the end of this, so stay tuned. Before we jump into the conversation, though, I want to thank everyone who's making this podcast happen over on Patreon. If you guys like this podcast and you like what I do at all, please consider becoming a Patreon patron. Uh, you can join for like as little as three dollars a month. Everything counts. If I had like a hundred thousand of you guys giving at, at three dollars a month, we the production value would go up for sure. So something to consider. If you like this, you want to see me stick around, please consider becoming a Patreon patron. You can find the link in the description wherever you get this podcast at. All right, uh, enough selling myself. Let's jump into the conversation with Dr. Tom Ward. Dr. Ward, thanks so much for coming on the podcast again, man. Third time. Yeah, third third time. I'm honored. It's yeah, great it's... to be with you again, Parker. The, the I, I I love being with you. I love hearing what you have to say. The only thing that... that, uh, that is trepidatious for me makes me fearful is this the stash man you always come on and you outdo me with the mustache but uh a lot of my listeners are, are just listening so they won't they won't see that well if i could make a comment i mean i it seems like yours has come a long way um you know as the as parker's pensies has has progressed and and developed into a major player in the christian philosophy podcast world awesome. your mustache has come right alongside it and, <laughs> Thanks, and actually i was when i was watching you in the intro just now i uh, i was a, a question formed in my mind about how you how you trim it and mm. could i ask that question to you, you could um it's really a simple answer i i just don't trim it you just don't trim it yeah so, i just i just play with it so you yeah. have like right in the center it looks like looks like you that's that's my italian it. heritage okay so it just it just separates like that yep Oh. My brother's is even more like his, like that. It's like embarrassingly uh, separated. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So all all of mine just goes straight down and and then curls inward. Actually. So see, I I I I want that. It's like this the classic, you know, ladies with straight hair versus ladies with curled hair. They always yeah yeah they always want yeah. the opposite. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's so good. Well, I'm glad oh, man. that important issue. That's right. That's right. I, I told you uh, earlier in a message that I'm not going to let this evolve into uh, a conversation on fashion, but you you got this amazing fashion sense, man, and you dress like a philosopher. And uh, just so you know, some of us are watching you and, and seeking to emulate that style. So please keep it up. Okay. I'll, I'll keep that in mind. Thanks. Uh, I'll, try, I'll try not to let people down too much. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, man. It's important. Yeah. Um, so y you start I this book this off. Wonderful waffle knit. Um, sort of blazer double-breasted blazer sweater that i'm wearing right now yeah. but it doesn't really come across in the there we in, go in the video but it's oh it's man pretty nice yeah yeah that's pretty slick that's yeah. pretty slick i'm yeah i'm gonna resist the temptation to follow that rabbit trail okay. uh okay. this this book let's get let's get into to uh john dunn scotus um man so you start off the book by saying giving the story about a reviewer of one of your other books on scotus and uh, they asked this question, you know, whether or not this whole project after reading the book, whether or not this project of interpreting him and laying out his arguments, like whether that's even worth it. And then you said you 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 clip that and put it up on your wall uh, and you said, you know, next time I write a book, I'm going to say, uh, what does SCOTUS think? And then why should we care? I thought that was pretty. Is, is that a true story? You, you did that? You had it clipped up on your wall? 
It's, it's a true story. Yeah. Yeah, that review came out of the book and of my first book, you know, very technical book, not of general interest. And uh, yeah, and the reviewers said that and it just broke my little heart because I had worked <laughs> so hard yeah. on that book. And it was even a fellow specialist who knew a lot about SCOTUS and wasn't a stranger to hard work thought, man, this is just really hard work. Is it worth it? <laughs> yeah, so I, I literally printed it out and had it taped above my desk um, as kind of motivation. Um, Cause on the one hand it was, th there was the challenge aspect of it. Like, Hey man, like, yes, it's worth it. Yeah. But then on the other hand, there was like, like I, I sensed, you know, uh, there was some self reproach, like, yeah, the, like I have been doing this, all this really technical stuff on SCOTUS and, and if possible, I really would like to try to e explain it to people who haven't been studying scholastic philosophy for years and years, like I have, and try to mm -hmm. say what's uh valuable about it so yeah, yeah the challenge and and that's what the book comes out of yeah well so this book is um it's it's fascinating because it's oh, man uh even to take up this task is pretty daunting that you're saying like this is a book where if you are a scotus scholar you will get something out of it but you don't have to be in order to get something out of it and that's like this you know public facing philosophy that's so elusive that everyone's going after today and i think you did a great job if someone did read this book and said well i wanted i do want to get in more technical what was that book that um the reviewer was reviewing the more technical one um, it's a book called John Dunn Scotus on parts, holes, and hylomorphism. That and good. it was published by Brill in 2014. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. That's so good. What, was that, did that come out of your dissertation or is that just, so yeah, that, that, that okay. was my dissertation book. Um, awesome. I expanded it a little for the book, but yeah, it was essentially my dissertation. Awesome. Fantastic, man. Um, so I guess, like you, you have these two questions in mind, you know, what, what does he think and why should anyone care? Um, was that the, was that like the impetus for writing this book or, or is this like a, a, yeah, why write this book? When, why now, I guess. Yeah. It, I actually started it, um, a long time ago in 2013. So this mm. was, this was before the review that I've mentioned even oh, wow. came out of my first yeah. book. So I, I was at basically in this place where I had finished my PhD, I had gotten my first tenure track job, and I was happy about all that, fulfilled in the sort of work I was doing, teaching and writing a few articles here and there, but also had the sense of, uh, you know, I'm now doing, doing very weird niche philosophical historical work. And mm -hmm. not only does this uh, like not really register as important or interesting for the majority of my philosophy friends. <laughs> um, but like, let a, you know, like my family doesn't understand what I do. Most of my non-philosophy friends don't understand what I do. And even my philosophy friends don't understand what I do. So I, I, I should, I should like see if I could kind of sketch out a book that would make SCOTUS interesting to anyone who's kind of, kind of interested in philosophy, even if they don't have background. And I remember as a college student reading um, uh, G.K. Chesterton's book on Aquinas. And yeah, the dumb ox, right? Dumb ox, yeah. And then his, what's sometimes published together with it, his book on St. Francis. And hmm. both of those books were, were really inspiring to me and helped me catch that medieval bug that I, you know, still haven't got rid of. Yeah. And um, so I thought, yeah, if I could do a book kind of at that level, um, on SCOTUS, you know, keep up with the technical work for my job, but then on the side, do this other thing. Yeah. So I got like two chapters uh, written at that point, way back then, and then had a table of contents, but, but basically just hit a ceiling where I, where I realized that I just don't know enough yet huh. to do this well. So I laid it aside. Um, we come back to it every few years. And then during COVID, actually, um, uh, with I just had a lot of time on my hands and yeah. picked it up and, and finished it. And at that stage in 2020, um, I just, it just kind of all came naturally. Though yeah. I imagined myself talking to students about SCOTUS as I was writing. And, okay. and at that point, you know, I had had enough experience by that point where it could all just come out in a, a non scholarly way, you know, but still grounded in, in my own years of reading and thinking. Yeah.
Man, that's awesome. And and I, I was really excited by this because uh, I would catch little little glimpses of SCOTUS uh, when I was in seminary. Uh, some of the sometimes the PhD students, you know, if they really wanted to sound smart, they would drop yeah. a SCOTUS line to Tom McCall in our Trinity class or something like that. And I'd be like, man, what? How do I get in on some SCOTUS stuff? I want to sound smart too. So I, I've I've really appreciated uh, this work uh, as an intro. And at the end, you give a bunch of uh, uh, resources to to follow up with if you want to study more. I, I wanted to get into like. So, so the PhD students who sounded super smart at TEDS would talk about the SCOTUS versus Aquinas beef and like the, the Dominicans versus the Franciscans. Can you just lay that out for us? Like what, yeah. What is this beef and like, what the heck's going on? Yeah. It, I mean, nowadays it primarily has to do with this question about univocity versus analogy. Mm -hmm. um, one, one point I make in the book is that that actually wasn't the original issue. Uh, that yeah. didn't seem like way back in the 13th century, um, it just wasn't a, a concern. I mean, there were, were already some fissures opening up between the Dominicans and Franciscans, but but that particular issue, which gets so much play now, just mm -hmm. wasn't really a concern. Um, I think more a more substantive issue would be like differences about um, uh, the natural law and its yeah. relation to divine freedom. That tends to be an issue with which really... Um, separates Scotists and and Thomists, um, mm -hmm. and I say I say it that way because I don't think there's quite as much separation between Aquinas and Scotus themselves on okay. on that issue. You know, Scotus representing the more voluntarist position, um, Aquinas representing a more non-voluntarist or sometimes called intellectualist tradition. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think the the one nowadays is the university and analogy. Um, I mean, really briefly, SCOTUS holds that uh, at least some of our language and concepts uh, by which we speak and think about God um, mean exactly the same thing uh, or have exactly the same content as they have when we think or speak about creatures as they have when as, as we think or speak about God. So yeah. university, the same one voice, so the same yeah. meaning. Uh, in both contexts, or as analogy is supposed to be this kind of middle way where Aquinas says we, uh, in order to reason deductively from the nature of creatures or the fact of the existence of creatures to the existence and nature of God, um, we've got to have stable meanings of terms. Otherwise, mm -hmm. we commit the fallacy of equivocation and fallacy of four terms. So we, we, we can't have that. But he says we can't have univocity either because mm -hmm. our our language and our way of thinking is specified to the structure of created being and and God doesn't have that structure. And so our, our words are bound to mean different things when we apply them to God. So it's so analogy is this like middle way. On the one hand, we can still reason validly to God from creatures. But on the other hand, we are supposed to um, recognize this vast metaphysical difference between God and creatures in our semantics about religious language. Yeah. And, um, you know, so, so that topic university versus analogy really divides SCOTUS. Some people have described SCOTUS as idolatrous yeah. or as, as flattening the gap between God and creatures, uh, all of this crazy stuff mm. that um, is really overblown because I mean, like, think about the core conviction that Aquinas and Scotus share, namely that we can do natural theology in a deductive or quasi-deductive way. We can reason from the nature of created being to God and yeah. both recognize that a, a, con a condition on being able to do that is uh, not to equivocate, to have, right. mean to have terms that mean not you know not the same thing that that prejudice is the debate but but that have to call it sufficient unity of meaning stability of meaning uh in order to reason validly and yeah. and that core conviction to me is so much more important than whatever differences their theories end up having or whatever differences in labels they give to their theories and i do run an argument in the book that um as i read the texts Aquinas, by the word univocity, yeah. means something different than Scotus, <laughs> yeah. by the word univocity. 
Yeah, so that. U- univocal is not a univocal term. And yeah. I actually think there's a lot more um, similarity between the two than difference. Yeah. And I think that, you know, scholars who truck in this overblown rhetoric about um, a univocity leading to idolatry or functional atheism um, <laughs> yeah. is really irresponsible. And not just because it's false, but because it drives a wedge between Christian intellectuals when there needn't be one, mm-hmm. you know, which isn't to say that, that, that they have exactly the same position, that there are no relevant differences at all. Right. But it, it creates this sour spirit of, of debate so that it's not constructive, but, you know, like the, the Thomists or the analogy supporters saving Christianity yeah. or 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 um, you know fighting for God against those evil her- yeah like heretics or functional yeah, yeah functional yeah. heretics and it's it's really yeah it's really um, charged language because it's like dude I thought we were I thought we were talking about stuff that none of us really know that we're trying to grasp at and like and now all of a sudden I'm a heretic now yeah. Um, yeah. I, 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 I side with the uh, analogical, you know, predicators, um, yeah. but I, I did appreciate that in, in the book about uh, uh, univocal language. I think what, what you're saying is like, you know, Scotus and Aquinas are both saying like, we need to be able to speak literally about God. Yeah. Um, and Aquinas is like, well, you can speak literally and not univocally. And I think I, I hear it all the time in, in, from my philosopher and my theologian friends, most of my philosopher friends are like, analogies out, dude, because you have to have some kind of univocal core. So let me just talk about that core, and I don't need the analogy. And all the theologians are like, we need the creator-creature distinction. And if you don't have that, if you don't have analogy, then you're shooting, you know, through the chasm to God or whatever. And so I, it, it still comes up all the time. In in and it, there's two Parkers that live in here that fight each other too. Um, so it's tough, man. I, I, but I do appreciate you saying like, this is not, this doesn't have to be as extreme. We, we, we probably don't need to burn each other, uh, yeah. at the stake for, for this one. Yeah. yeah. I think that's um, right. But it, it brings us to, um, to my next question about, uh, God's existence and, and, and being, um, Scotus runs, you know, an argument for God and, and we're not going to get super, uh, into the details here. If you guys want, like you need to go read the book for sure. It's a podcast. We can't always do all the the nitty gritty stuff. But um, Scotus starts his natural theological argument for God with scripture, which is, which is cool. I, th- I like that mode. It's maybe more like ramified natural theology or something, but um, starts with Exodus 3, 3, 14. I am that I am. That's what God says, you know, in response. And it seems like most of the medievals are saying like, Hey, that means that God is being, being itself. Um, I wonder about, before we get into the more the the argument and triple primacy stuff, I've always been confused about this idea because it sounds like it sounds like pantheism, like God is right. Like if He's being and I participate in being, then I am participating in God, and like what I am is made up of God, maybe or something. You know, like do you ever think about that? Do you ever worry about that? Is it weird? Yeah, it is weird. It's a it's a weird thing to say, uh, and. Uh, because they're 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 all emphatic that yeah, right. um, the world is not a pantheistic world. Yeah, uh, there's a, a difference between created being and an uncreated being. Scotus's preferred way of marking the difference is infinite being versus finite being. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, Aquinas will talk about God as as existence itself, right. and then everything else as um, having or sharing in like common being or something like that, you know, some sort of created being, yeah. um, that, that has some sort of similarity to divine being, but is different. So, so yeah, there are different ways of marking the difference, but, um, but they're all, they all agree that there's this big creature creator gap. And so then what could it mean to say God is existence itself? Because right. I exist, I'm not God. Um, yeah. so it looks like there's a, there's a part of existence that's not God's existence. And so what do they mean? Um, I mean, I think it's, I think for SCOTUS at least is it's something like, uh, uh, that, that there is in God, something like an, an original exemplar mm. of every possible way of existing. Um, and he has this distinction between two, two ways of, 
like having a um, a ratio of you know a, a, a mode or aspect or way of being. He says that some some of God's features he has formally, and so those would we would think of as the divine attributes, um, his goodness, wisdom, etc. And then uh, others he has eminently, mm. and it's quite mysterious exactly what that's supposed to mean. But um, God has somehow is the original exemplar of all the ways of being like being a giraffe or yeah. one of our examples from an earlier episode, like being a mustache. Yeah, it's also good. now in God or um, from eternity. But um, on Scotus's view, God has whatever, whatever formality, uh, you know, uh, intelligible content there is to being a giraffe or being a mustache is in God in this most eminent way. And yeah. that's supposed to be, something like he has that somehow, but we shouldn't say that that we worship a mustachioed God or right. that God has a purple tongue. Um, so anyway, that so the total existence that God is, according to Scotus, I think amounts to something like God's exemplarity, mm. uh, being the exemplar of any possible way of existence. Yeah rather than an identification of God with um, every single thing that exists. Yeah. Okay. I've always, I, um, I, I don't want to be an idealist and I don't know, like, I just don't think that's the right way to think about things. But wherever, anytime I think about God being existence himself or us existing in God, you know, all this language, I'm like, well, if we were, if we are divine ideas currently, and that would make a lot of sense, like uh, us being distinct, because maybe my thoughts are distinct from my substance, you know, mm -hmm. so so like I am not my thoughts, depending on who you ask, I guess. But that would be one way of making sense of it. But then I'm like, I don't know. Is that panentheism? You know, there's all sorts of like uh, bombs to uh, landmines to, to watch out for in this area. Yeah, it's wild. I don't know. Have you have you have you considered that at all? Is that, are you allowed to consider that, I guess, whether whether or not we are? currently yeah. ideas in God's mind? I mean, I mean, I think in in theology, one of the things that most blows my mind is just the, the sheer fact of created being. Hmm. And, and on several levels, too, because if, if God is what uh, Christians think God is, he's self-sufficient, uh, th three persons somehow enjoying this community or whatever i'm not getting into the personalist versus classical theism <laughs> debates here but you know, yeah. you know it, god has no need of anything and right. um, and yet create so that so that sort of like motivational aspect of creation like why would god do such a thing yeah. as create? and then secondly what would that act be I, I, yeah. that's that just like what yeah. would it be like to create be, yeah, not because there's the, the ex nihilo issue that's opaque to us. How yeah. you could make something um, out of nothing, and then also just like, what do you do to create? You know, <laughs> the difference. Yeah, God thinks. Say, I know this is too anthropomorphic, but you know, God, God thinks. Say, the world that He wants to make, and then decides, I'm going to make it. And so then, mm -hmm. what, what does God do next? Is it right. just like? And, and I have no, I can assign no like concepts to that, to, to answer that question. Um, well, so it's utterly yeah. mysterious. That, that's why, this is why I like analogy um, because I'm like, um, well, we have authors today and, you know, like J.R. R. Tolkien, you know, cause I know that that will stick with you cause you, you mentioned the Louvatar and all your stuff. Um, yeah, so so like Tolkien created this world by his words you know he 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 spoke and it was he he with with pen and paper and in a non-univocal but perhaps analogical fashion God created the world by his word but you're still like even with analogy it's still like what are the what's the mechanism you know like well he spoke and you're like yeah but I speak with air and vocal cords and he doesn't have those so like what are you saying and you're like dude I don't know man it's, it's an analogy <laughs> That's why yeah. it is what it is. Yeah, and 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 just to fully support the analogical thing in in that context, yeah. you know, and, and yeah. just referring briefly back to the earlier part of the conversation, 
that's not the sense of analogy i think that's at issue when okay. when aquinas and scotus are are talking about that like yeah it's when, it's when we say god's good or god is love or something like that yeah the the so-called you know uh, attributes of god where um yeah. or, you know by 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 virtue of divine simplicity in god the divine attributes are identical with each other and with god himself but we don't really know what that means because right. Uh, wisdom is not altogether the same thing as power, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and so we're left with like, how is it that we can say literally things about God when God is so different from us? Right. Um, and, anyway, but, but yeah, so, so we access mysteries through analogies. It's not, it's not altogether like this, but it's somewhat like this, or it's right. a helpful way of getting at something that we otherwise could, could have no access to. Mm. And I don't think that when we call, god wise or loving we're we're reasoning like that like okay yeah we don't really know what god is but if you think about like god is if, if you think of god as having love then maybe you are being love then then maybe that's a way of accessing the reality that god is uh, when we say that god speaks into existence um or is like an artist um yeah. who who creates you know i think that those are helpful analogies but but I do have a kind of half-baked view that where um, revelation, uh, particular scripture, gives a kind of image mm -hmm. um, of God or God's actions, that we should take that as the the primary significant, and that and and the rest as you know, like merely creature creaturely acts of speaking, for example, yeah. as yeah. like the things that are a little bit like. God's act of speaking. Right, um, right. We understand, yeah. we understand these images better, so we access it that way. But yeah. um, like, no, access. God is the speaker, yeah. and then whatever we do is sort of like speaking. That's that's and, so that's so good. I love that because because anytime uh, I my audience is sick of this, but I did write my master's thesis on the authorial analogy for God world relation, oh, so I talk cool. about it all the time. But um, when I would when I would broach this with people. They would be like, well, you know, should we really be caring, comparing the, the creator to the creature like this? And it's like, well, first of all, he did that and he, and we're made in his image. So if anything, uh, Tolkien authors in a sub creator way to the to the way that God authored the world, you know, so yeah, why not? Why not go that way the, with the original to the derivative? Yeah, I love it. It's so good, yeah. man. Get me all fired up. Well, OK, so let's go back to existence stuff. Um, uh, so. If it is, if it's uh, possible for anything to exist, it follows that God must exist because God is um, existence Himself itself. Like, um, can can you help us with like Scotus's reasoning on on his argument for God? We're not going to go into like probably existential quantifiers here, but <laughs> yeah, just a broad, broad sketch. Yeah, yeah. I, I think a helpful way of introducing it is to to compare it to two arguments that are probably a lot more familiar to people. Aquinas's yeah. first and second ways. So remember the first way it starts from from motion or change. So mm -hmm. some things are in motion, that is some things undergo change. And then you reason from that contingent fact um, about the world to the uh, to the existence of a prime mover unmoved. And then in the second way of Aquinas, we have the the fact that something comes into existence or something has come into existence. Um, uh, or has been efficiently caused. And then we reason from that contingent fact about the world that uh, that there must be an efficient cause that itself it doesn't have an efficient cause. So first yeah. cause, uh, uncaused. Yeah. And what Scotus does is he, is he takes, one way to think about what he's doing is that he has that kind of cosmological uh, approach those, those first and second ways are often described as cosmological arguments as mm -hmm. i know that you know um, he takes that cosmological approach but instead of starting with contingent premises about um, uh, actually existing things he starts with with necessary premises about possibly existing things yeah. so uh, as, as you put it something can come into existence or possibly something begins to exist or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, and it's, and, and then reasons from that necessary premise to the actual existence of something that uh, by nature 
is able to produce something else, yeah. but cannot be produced by anything else. Um, so if you have something that uh, cannot be produced by anything else, but which is, so to speak, a um, necessary condition for the uh, production of anything else, then yeah. it fails to exist. Nothing exists. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and yet, you know, uh, 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 but, but it, but it at least can exist, right? That's yeah. the crucial premise for Skoda. So yeah. it, lots of most, most things that uh, can exist can also not exist. Mm -hmm. But, um, but if, suppo suppose that this uh, nature, which by nature cannot be produced by anything else, suppose it didn't exist. Well, since nothing can cause its own existence and this thing can't be produced, then it couldn't exist. It, yeah. it would be impossible for it to exist, but it's possible for it to exist. Yeah. So it exists. Yeah. So you get a kind of hybrid of a cosmological approach to God's existence with um, an ontological uh, approach to God's existence. And SCOTUS actually explicitly acknowledges that he's touching up Anselm um, so in, in the context in which he gives this argument. You know, he's, it seems to be deeply inspired both by not necessarily Aquinas's cosmological arguments, but but Aristotle's arguments yeah. for first mover, um, combined with with Anselm's arguments for uh, uh, you know unnecessary un being, being. Yeah. which nothing greater could be conceived. Yeah. Well, so I think it just hit me as you were laying it out that it it does have a kind of like transcendental nature, which is which is kind of fun, where it's like possibly something comes into existence. Um, but but what must be true in order for that possibility? Well, you have to have something else. And so you're reasoning almost you know, transcendentally to the source. And then all you have to do is say like something. Well, it's stronger than like starting with a banana and going backwards in a contingency argument. It, this is like possibly there's a banana. So you yeah. don't even I don't even need to point to a particular banana, though I could. That's this right. is even for the possibility. So even if bananas don't exist, that still presupposes this thing that that you need to have uh, bananas coming into existence, which That's is right. like super epic, man. That's so good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a it's a really creative argument. It, it's it's original to Scotus, obviously drawing on aspects of earlier arguments. As far as I can tell, um, a, a Scotus doesn't see his arguments as um, like supplanting other arguments or coming to the rescue of deficiencies yeah. in other arguments um with i mean even his even his coloring anselm as he puts it is not um it's just a minor tweak so it's not like everything's wrong before right. and so now finally we can show that god exists so it's, it's right. just adding to the stock of good arguments um so it's it's original it's really rigorous i mean much more rigorous than we've said here right. in the right. conversation or even that i give in the book but but then there's also this cool um extra feature of it so he he starts with um establishing what he calls the primacy of efficiency so mm. like god is the first efficient cause um more 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 correctly or more technically for scotus god is the first uh, first thing able to produce an effect because yeah. whether or not god efficiently caused anything he would be able to produce an effect right. right he's only an efficient cause if in fact he has yeah uh, so and he in fact has so he is the efficient cause but it's more important for the argument that god is the first thing able to produce an effect so yeah. so having to his mind established that god is the first in the order of efficiency mm -hmm. he then mm -hmm. uh, uh argues that there is a first in the order of final cause Mm -hmm. uh, causality and then a first in what he calls the order of eminence so um basically an anselmian uh, uh perfect being you know okay. that, that nothing greater can be conceived so the most eminent nature yeah um so runs arguments showing that there's the first in efficiency the first in finality the first in eminence and then argues that these that 
only one nature can have all of these three things and yeah uh, so yeah, they all they all refer to the same nature the same they all refer to the same nature yeah so cool i love that because then it's like well maybe we have three gods like no these all like co-refer yeah he calls this the the triple primacy so yeah. god god has the triple primacy of efficiency finality and eminence um, well so this this part is really fun <clears throat> because i mean like famously aquinas is like we can't prove the trinity from reason alone and it seems like scotus is like yeah i, I agree but here's some triple primacy stuff. And then he's like, well, divine love unites them all. Yeah. Right. So, so it's like, well, is this an argument for the Trinity? Like, what? what, what no. Is, what are, okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Because no, they, I, all, they all co-refer to like the divine nature, maybe. Yeah. I mean, I, I've wondered the same thing, but yeah. I, I did. I did finally come down on, on the side of a firm. No, okay. I don't think that's what he's doing on okay. purpose. And I don't think that we should read that on to him. Okay. Um, and that's, that's, that's because you know, he given the modal kind of aspect of the argument, mm -hmm. what he's talking about is uh, natures. So yeah. he'll, he'll say things like there is a nature such that it can be produced, you know, mm -hmm. uh, um, therefore there is a nature such that uh, it cannot be produced, but is the, uh, first thing able to produce an effect. Yeah. So that can't so be one person of the Trinity because the other two wouldn't have that. Exactly. Yeah. Because we're talking about, yeah, we're talking about natures. And one thing about Trinitarian theology and metaphysics is that we have exactly one nature yeah. uh, shared by three persons. And yeah. So we don't want to have, you know, the great, the most eminent thing be the, uh, the spirit, yeah. blah, blah, blah. So, so don't, good. don't go that way. But yeah. But it's it, hard because it we want uh, threes. We see threes and we're like, dude, finally we got it. And like, no, don't, don't do it. It's just maybe, maybe three is God's favorite number. And that's why, you know, you can prove them three times over. Yeah. I, I don't know if you're acquainted with the theologian, Fred Sanders. Yeah. Um, he was a mentor of mine in college. And oh, no way, dude. That's awesome. I have huge admiration for, but you know, he, he does, he, this is like his stick, you know, hashtag also not like the trinity <laughs> yeah yeah right all the all the standard examples you know that the egg and the yeah. clover and yeah. all of that <laughs> he's hilarious by the way it, people should follow him on social media he's a really funny oh, guy gosh. Yeah. yeah oh such a good sense of humor yeah and so so smart and clever and yeah i i just when i think of him i think of like he, he to me he's like someone who's holding down the fort in in trinitarian thought where he's he's like not quite Hey, not quite. Uh, hey, don't do that. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't know a whole ton of his like constructive work. I mostly know like, no, don't do that. Which yeah. is cool. We need people like that. But yeah, I'm sure he has other constructive work as well. That's right. He does. Yeah. 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 Um. Okay. So, uh, we've got first efficient, the first efficient cause, the first final cause. Actually, um, I, I think I understand the you know first imperfection, the Anselmian way. I think I understand, you know, at least for the sake of our conversation, the first efficient cause. Um, what, help me with the first final cause. Does that have to do with like the chain of being that the God's like on top of the chain of being and all things are directed up at, at, at something, or I'm not, I'm not sure if I know that argument very well. Yeah, it, it ends up there. Okay. Um, so, so yeah, you're right to make that connection. Um, yeah. So the, so to be the first final cause, um, in Scotus's lingo, is is to be that for the sake of which everything comes about yeah and the the basic idea here is that um like uh chain chains of final causality are transitive just okay. like chains of efficient causality and stand in much in as much need of a, a first as chains of efficient causality so if you thought that if you were if you were sympathetic with the no infinite regress uh, premise sure. of cosmological arguments, then by Scotus's lights, you should be equally sympathetic with his premise that there can't be an infinite regress of uh, final, causes. Uh, final cause chains. So then, then the, the thought would be, well, maybe you could have final causal chains that really do terminate in firsts, but they're just a whole bunch of firsts. Yeah. That's, that's my next question. Yeah. 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 Like, you know, I think, I think Aristotle thinks this in some sense, um, you know, in term when he does his argument for the prime mover, of course he thinks that uh, 
the intelligences that move the heavenly spheres that keep the earth kind of moving around and in being that they they do everything out of love for the first final the, the, excuse me the, the prime mover and so in that yeah. sense the prime mover for aristotle is the first final cause yeah uh, um that's actually how how aristotle's cosmological argument works it has nothing yeah. to do with efficient causation it has yeah. to do with with final causation but then at the same time despite that fact about aristotle if you look at like the nicomachean ethics mm -hmm. and and in in chapter one in the book one what we get is an account of the human good as happiness and uh and comments about like you know happiness has the sort of the right kind of nature or quality to terminate um explanations of you know, what we're doing yeah and so then it would be like well there's your happiness and my happiness and so on and so forth and so why is it that uh, you know my like every why can't we just say that everything that i do is for the sake of my flourishing as an individual so that terminates a, one final causal chain mm -hmm. and likewise for you and then all the others and i think here um I mean, this is going well beyond what what Scotus yeah. himself says in the when he gives this argument. But but in to maybe help people be sympathetic with this idea would be the thought that human happiness at least has this um, like we we can't like it's, it's one thing to to specify the the sorry the state of a human being that um like is that state for the sake of which human willing or human action uh, uh, goes on that's right. another thing to to describe the object in relation to which a human being would be in such a state you know? okay. and so so in one sense the final end of human action is god himself because yeah. god is the good is infinitely good um and so can satisfy all desire yeah but then in, a, in another sense the human end is happiness uh mm -hmm. because it is it is what we're what we're trying to achieve yeah in our pursuit of god so i mean there you you could you could see how the final causal looked at in one way the final causal chain that seems to terminate in my happiness actually terminates in yeah god uh, well, I, I, I think that that's really good. I thought maybe you were going to go a different route and say like, well, look, if, if everyone has their own happiness, then maybe we can't even talk about each other as being happy because how do I know that your happiness is like my happiness? So that I think th there might be another way to run it too and say like, no, like we, this is the problem of nominalism or of uh, uh, going in for uh, tropes or something like that. Like you, you there's got to be something that unifies this happiness in order for us to actually like predicate it of each other. And so there needs to be something here and that can't be the final form because it is directed at God too. Or I think yeah. there's other ways. Yeah. Other ways to mess yeah. around with that. That's fun. Yeah. And then a another kind of wrinkle to this, that's um, quite different from what we've just been saying is that SCOTUS does have a, uh, a view about final causality where it o only intelligent agents can, um, uh, l l let me back up actually so yeah. so he says this weird thing about final causes that seems to require that there is only final causality where there is intelligence so here's okay. what he says that you know the the final cause you might think is like the end uh that something is pursuing and scotus actually tries to make a distinction between the end as what something aims at and the end as a final cause mm. and and the reason he gives is that to be a cause an end has to be prior to the to what it causes yeah okay that makes i mean that it's, seems intuitive yeah so then you know the we say that the end of an acorn is to become flourishing oak tree like, okay yeah scotus would say yes you know he's a good aristotelian uh, yeah. things really do act for the sake of ends. But what he'll say is that just because the 
acorn is you know, ordered by its nature to, um, to grow into a flourishing orc, oak, oak tree that doesn't entail that you know, something like the oak tree or the, the completed oak tree is a cause of the acorn's activity, a yeah. developmental activity. So yeah. in, order to, in order for that end oak tree to be a cause of the acorn's existence and characteristic life activity, the oak tree has to be uh, cognized by some agent who acts to bring about the acorn, at least in part, for the sake of the oak tree. Yeah. So it, as Sc in Scotus's lingo, it is the end insofar as it is loved. Huh. That is the final cause of whatever is finally caused. Yeah. They love, they, I mean, they, they really like the medievals really like using love in all these ways. Yeah. That they were like, what the heck? But it's like, yeah, but you say you love a taco. So maybe don't, you know, maybe yeah. don't uh, hammer the medievals for their use of love too much. I, yeah. I, I think that this acorn and oak tree thing makes a lot of sense. It, maybe I'm totally getting it wrong, but it's like, man, how could this tree be the final, the, the full oak tree be the final cause of this acorn if it doesn't exist yet? Maybe if you go in for like B theory of time and say, is, is there in the future drawing, you know, that's like backward causation or something. But instead it's like, no, like the form of the tree is what drives it there. And like you have a, a, a lover and admirer and intelligence that's, that's, that is shaping it towards that idea of, of it as a complete tree. Yeah. That's all right. Yeah. Yeah. Dude, that's awesome. I like that. Yeah. That's really cool. Um, all right. So that's so we so we have this triple primacy. Everyone's gotta grab the book for that alone. Like that's super fantastic. Maybe don't say that that's an argument for the Trinity. You kind of kind of hint at it. That's what like some of my favorite like theologians on the reform side of things, John Frame, will just be like, There's three here and God's three. And so, you know, that's good enough. Maybe don't make the connection too much. Um, <laughs> but I I would be remiss if I didn't uh, you know, foist this onto my listeners, this, this idea of, uh, hexaity. And, um, I, I pronounce my podcast Parker's Pensies. I, I do it intentionally because I don't want to sound like, uh, you know, sound like the middle-aged lady saying gracias at the Spanish restaurant and being just embarrassing herself. I don't speak French, so I don't try to do it. I'm an American swine. However, the, the one thing that, that made me think maybe I should say Ponce's and try to pronounce it is I heard Steven Pinker, uh, on a podcast once and he goes you know the medievals thought you know they had this idea of a, a hecate and i was like no what and i was like dude I, now i understand the french speakers listening and how much they must hate my pronunciation so it's a, a hexaity it's not that it's not that hard it's close maybe i'm but at least i'm not saying hecate right yeah, yeah now i think I, did you say this was this was uh, tom thomas pink who, who uh steven this? steven pinker steven steven pinker oh, yeah. Oh, oh, oh yeah yeah i mean in terms of just the the latin uh that's perfectly fine oh and, no and maybe maybe you can say hecate correct oh that's horrible Not, i wouldn't say hecate but but in terms of like if you were reading the latin word okay hecatos i think would probably be the most accurate way of okay of pronouncing the latin yeah. So then, so then our word H A E C C E I T Y, like yeah. that's an English word. It's right. it's like transliterated from the Latin. But so so then, what I well, my view is that despite the fact that hecate or something like that would be um, would would reflect Latin pronunciation better than hexaity. Yeah. Nevertheless, hexaity is an English word, yeah. and the most common way to pronounce that word is hexaity. Okay. Not any other pronunciation, and so uh, there's like the uh, an argument. It's sort of an argument from custom or or convention. Like this is the yeah. convention to be established. We should stick to it. Right. Um, and so yeah, I mean maybe maybe there's like a circle of users of that word who <laughs> consistently say hecate. Yeah. Um, maybe it's like the um, Augustine Augustine. Uh, yeah, well, we've that, we've we've solved that one on the podcast. Uh, Augustine is in Florida. Augustine is in heaven. Yeah, that, I like, yeah I'm with yeah. you. I'm with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. Um, yeah, well, let's, what, let's the heck say it. -y. Yeah, what the heck is this thing? Yeah, Thisness. yeah, yeah. Um, 
it, it's, it's, you know, sometimes thought of as, I think something basically like a, like a bear particular. In oh, contempt. sweet. I was going to ask you about that. Yeah. But it's not, it's not. That. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, let me say what it is. Uh, yeah. Uh, so the medieval medieval scholasticism had this um, this interesting debate. Aquinas weighed in on it. Pretty pretty much everyone weighed in on it. What is the principle of individuation? Mm -hmm. um, so the idea is 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 something like this: like suppose you are some sort of a realist about universals. So you mm -hmm. say, all right, uh, there's there's such a thing as human nature. There's such a thing as being six feet tall. There's such a thing as having brown hair, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All of these are shareable features, like yeah. things that things can hold in common. So if you're a realist about these features, then uh, when you have an individual bearer of those features, mm -hmm. uh, there's got to be something explanatorily prior to all of the shareable things in virtue of which the, that bearer is one individual thing, right? right? So if if you're if you are a realist, whether an extreme realist or moderate realist or whatever brand flavor, yeah. Yeah. you have to have a principle of individuation. Mm -hmm. If you're a nominalist, you don't have that problem. You just say, well, I don't need to explain what individuates things because things don't come any other way but individuated. Yeah, they have the converse problem of like, well, then what do you what 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 are properties and how do they how do I share the same property? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So Scotus is on the realist side of this as uh, almost everyone was until Occam and then there was a little bit more of a free for all, but but yeah. some form of realism was still ascendant um, for a long long time. Mm. And uh and so so the idea is this, the uh, Aquinas offered probably the most well-known principle of individuation. He said it was matter. And, yeah. and in particular, matter, uh, materia signata, matter signed or designated by quantity, uh, dimensive quantity. So you have something like a chunk of matter. Yeah. And, uh, and, and that is what individuates this particular human being who is six feet tall and brown haired and is it a chunk of did he did i don't know aquinas uh, super well did he did he go in for like prime matter was it a chunk yeah of prime matter or and once it's like individuated it's not prime matter anymore because it has it's particularized or something yeah so there would be a, a distinction between uh prime matter materia prima and materia signata you know it's okay. like prime matter designated by signed by gotcha uh, you know, sig if you think about a signet ring, yep. like you, you have the wax and then it's signated so by the good. ring. The yeah. wax is so prime matter. Yeah. 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 Now, Aquinas's view was was criticized on several fronts, including by Scotus. And I think the best criticism is that um, on the broadly Aristotelian ontology that they both accepted, uh quantity was considered a a way of being a substance and so it it you, so the existence of a substance is at least explanatorily prior to the quantity of the substance you know the okay. quantitative dimension or or shape that the substance is or has okay and so it can't serve to individuate because as a kind of accidental form, ah. quantity is ontologically dependent on substance. So, and, and you still need to individuate that substance. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. That's exactly. good. So yeah. it's, it arrives too late on the scene, explanatory yeah. scene, to be an individuating principle. Okay. There, there were other views too. Like one, one was like to, to say that what individuates things is purely negative. Like to be individual is to be um uh, not something else not something yeah distinct from yeah not something else. <laughs> one so not Scotus, Scotus criticized all of these and the that what he came up with is that one the the principle of individuation has to be ontologically positive it can't be a negation or a privation it has to be a positive thing in order to do the explanatory work of individuating 
and it has to be, you know, um, has to have the right kind of priority to the substance itself that it individuates. Okay. So he came up with this idea of thisness. That's literally what hekeitas means or hekseitas. Yeah. It, it literally means thisness. Um, and so the idea is that, say, there's there's Parker's uh, human nature, uh, Parker's particular shape and size and etc. Yeah. And then there is Parkerness. Yeah. Uh, which is something like something analogous to uh, a form, but okay. it is different from a form precisely in that it is not shareable or repeatable. Yeah. So you can't have many Parkers and you can't have something, you know, that like now you have Parkerness, but then, you know, maybe you die and then Parkerness becomes something that something else might have. Right. Nope. If whatever has Parkerness is Parker. So, so even my clone, my, my identical clone does not have my quiddity. That's right. Your hexi- clone. Your hexi- oh yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. I, I meant to bring in quiddity. Because I don't understand quiddity either. Whatness, but. whatness. So, so you yeah. have so the qu- quiditas, <laughs> what, yeah. um, uh, hexaitas, this. So you, so like, what is it? There, you're asking the question about you know the metaphysical question that's you know like to what kind does it belong? Oh, uh, oh. So does quiddity pick out like my humanity? Yeah. Okay. Okay, yeah. but 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 I'm a particularized humanity. A a hex hexity hexity yeah. yeah humanity uh an individual human substance made individual by your parkerness your hexity gotcha. yeah that's good that's yeah. really good yeah i love so, these words i want i want to bring them back so cool yeah. Words. Yeah. yeah yeah here here's a way here's an easy way to misunderstand hexity because it's um because i'd kind of like it to be true so um so the thought is that you are like this hexity is not this bare particular that um, all of your features are contingently attached to. You know, okay. it's not it's not as though it, like could, we we could ask the question: Could Parker be um, a frog? Mm-hmm. And and in order for Parker to be a frog, given that you're a human now, you would have to lose your humanity and gain your frogginess and gain, gain frogginess. Yeah. And if you were thinking of hexity just as like a, a pin cushion, then you think, well, what would be the problem with that? Like yeah. you would need a weird kind of explanation to show why some of the pins in the pin cushion can't be pulled out. You know, like the, 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 the having a mustache pin, yeah, uh, that can be pulled out, but having a human pin that can't be, that would just be, it'd be weird. So, so don't think of hexity as uh, a bare particular or a metaphysical that, pin cushion. That's a really good analogy. That that so the bare particular would be the pin cushion, and I just have all these pins in here, and they're all red. But why can't I switch out all these red pins with green pins? Because if it's a bare particular, it seems like it just yeah that survives the transfer of all of these properties. Yeah, yeah, that's so good. Yeah. And that's not what Scotus has in mind here right. at all. Instead, he thinks that you're. Um, your Parkerness is is individuating a human nature. Yeah. So it's it's like you are you are essentially the particular human you are mm-hmm. because of Parkerness. Now, like, so your your humanity is shared by all, but the but the particular humanity that you are, or the particular human being you are, is due to so to speak the the contraction of humanity plus parkerness this isn't i'm wondering if this uh bringing in the more con- modern conversation if if this like commits us to, like origin essentialism or something like is 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 my parents is that uh part of my parkerness or what do you, what do you make of that i don't think so cool. uh, I, I i don't think that scotus thinks this uh okay. about pretty much anything uh but it is it's a difficult issue um I'm not going to get into the weeds on it, but it, yeah. yeah, Scotus has going a little bit back to the uh, the argument for a first in the order of efficiency. Uh-huh. 
what what SCOTUS is trying to do in that argument is to say that uh, uh, by their very natures, mm -hmm. everything that can come into existence has this essential order to God. Yeah. Right? It's, it's like built into our natures that uh, we can only exist in so far as we have some causal connection to the first in the order of efficiency. Okay. So, so there you think, okay, that's a kind of essentiality of origin. Yeah. <laughs> we got to, but so then you ask, well, what else? Like, is there anything else that, that is sort of baked into our natures such that we can only come about insofar as we're in a causal chain with that thing in addition yeah. to God? And there, like, I've, I've put that question to SCOTUS uh, really hard. And, yeah. and, and he just doesn't say anything. No, he, <laughs> I haven't found an answer. <laughs> That's good. That's good. I haven't found a good answer. So one worry that I have is that like gosh it like maybe that maybe we have no essential order to anything except for god mm. and so to then then it's just like free for all yeah. yeah could you have been could could god have created you ex nihilo like all by yourself you know maybe in a nice park or something so that you could breathe air and have sure. grass to run around in um like need you have had human parents at all I don't think so for SCOTUS, yeah. is that, let alone need you have had the very parents that you have. So, yeah, I think probably SCOTUS uh, is at least committed to a strong denial of the essentiality of origin, except, of course, for God. Yeah. Um, but that's, that's a hard issue. Yeah. And, and you could say that, like, well, technically speaking, that's possible. But, look, if you wanted to create me... Uh, being someone who could have a, this conversation on this podcast right now, then no, I would need to have this. So it's like it's like a contingent type thing. Contingent yeah, when we're, when we're thinking about ourselves as, um, you know, like we often talk about our identity, not in a strictly metaphysical sense, but in something like my personality, my background, my character. Right. Uh, and then, and there, yeah. Then, like, in that much more contingent way we we could say yeah it, it's hard to imagine right someone with this identity in that sense um having a like maybe you could slightly tweak the origin story but not yeah. much before you start getting a very different sort of person yeah and i so i i always think of this all in light of the uh authorial analogy for for the god world relation and thinking about like my god had me in mind prior to the story or did he you know now we got super lapsarianism in for lapsarian. it's 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 fascinating when you start like getting into this stuff i love it it's so exciting for me um i got one more question for you but but actually maybe like a half question before that um i, I posed this to uh one of your colleagues uh dr robert garcia about um his his theory of tropes and nfts uh non-fungible tokens which aren't you know now it seems like it's a huge scam and it was more it was more fun to talk about it back then now maybe i'm perpetuating a, a scam or something like that sorry folks but it seems like a hexady, like an NFT is like maybe a, a decent way of thinking through like a, a hexady, like it's a non-fungible token. There's only one of these things. It's like it is unique insofar as that's what NFTs are. What, have you thought about that? Is that does that sound right? Um, yes, it does sound right. Um, and I like the qualification insofar as that's what NFTs right. are. Um right because that lets me that lets me say yeah that sounds right okay. because i actually don't understand an, an nft and the okay. I, I, just, I haven't looked into it yeah. uh, people talk about it. it doesn't make any sense to me i don't know that very many people do understand them um okay. so i, I think yeah. we're, we're both safe in that i'm definitely out of my depth here yeah. when it comes yeah. to nfts but yeah. yeah so if that's what an nft is then yeah that, that, okay. that does sound right <laughs> that's pretty cool so i i like i i, I say that in hopes of being uh, of doing some more like public facing philosophy stuff where it's like that, that's what some of the abstract thinkers who are non philosophers are talking about. I'm like, Hey, have you heard of Hexaides? Uh, nice. No, not, not Steven Pinker's pronunciation, but the in like luring them into philosophy and theology. Um, yeah. I, I want, I wanted to end, um, man, this might be the wrong one and you can just pass if you want to, but just talking about like, so thinking of the authorial analogy, God made the world. Um, 
we have this explanation even for Adam and Eve's sin because the serpent was there tempting them. But what about the serpent? What about primordial sin? Um, I think if I've read this right, uh, Duns Scotus follows Anselm in giving this qualification between two types of affections. Um, do we? Do you think we got? Can Can you help us figure that one out real quick? Just Just maybe enough to give people a taste that they can go buy the book. Yeah, this is this is awesome. I I, I just love this uh, two so called two wills or two affections theory of the will. Yeah, and and yeah, you're right. Um, Scotus gets it from Anselm, and Anselm develops this understanding of the will in the context of uh, like angelic sin. Like, yeah, yeah just as you put it, how do we explain Lucifer's sin or the serpent's sin? Um, or being sinful. So, so the, the idea is, I, I'll, I'll try to be brief, but the, like, think about um, what you might think of as like a broadly Aristotelian or roughly Aristotelian way of thinking about human action that we, like everything we do is in some sense or other aimed at our happiness, you know, mm -hmm. happiness considered as eudaimonia flourishing, not mere hedonism or whatever, but yeah. So we're always happiness aimers. Um, and in, so in some sense, looking out for our own good. Uh, what Anselm does, and Scotus follows him, is to, to imagine like an angelic being like Lucifer uh, with a will like that, a, a mm -hmm. happiness maximizing will. And so imagine Lucifer like recognizing, like, gosh, God made me really great. And, and I'm grateful for that, but God could make me even greater than I am. Mm. Yeah, I'd be more powerful, more intelligent. I'd have more honor. I'd be happier. Um, I want that higher status that mm. God could give me, but has not so far. Yeah. So that, that could be a you know possible object of Lucifer's will. Now, if he were a happiness maximizer, he could do something like, he could think something like this. Um, I want that thing, that higher status, let's call it. Um, God could give it to me, but God has not. Um, you could think all of that, presumably non-sinfully, but like there's nothing, it doesn't seem to be anything wrong with just thinking all of those things, um, like recognizing those truths. Right. But now suppose he, he wills, like, I, I want to be that, like, like, like I'm going like I'm sort of my will is committed in that direction. Yeah. And even if I recognize that it's not possible for me to do anything about it, to give me that higher status, like the the fact that I can't get there is going to be a cause of sadness or bitterness or something like that. So um, so his will is just sort of all in on having that higher status. Yeah. And that and that seems at first like that should be wrong, you know, for Lucifer to be upset at God for not having that status. For Lucifer to be committed to achieving that status, if there's anything that he can do about it, um, like all of those things would seem to be wrong. But Anselm says they can't. They can't be wrong if all there is to Anselm's will is to pursue his own happiness, because all that Ansel, all that Lucifer yeah. is really wanting there is to be as happy as he could possibly be. Mm -hmm. So, so he would be. Um, not responsible for not morally responsible for wanting this higher status that he has. Yeah. All right. So what Anselm does is he, he says that uh, native to Lucifer's will and also to every created will is not only this inclination toward our own happiness, but also an inclination toward what is just. Mm -hmm. And these can off, these can coincide but they need not coincide. Yeah. So in the case of the higher status that Lucifer would want just by his affection for his own advantage, um, Lucifer can also recognize that God is to be obeyed, to be loved yeah. above all things. God hasn't granted that status. Um, and so he should just be okay with that. <laughs> Yeah. So that, in that sense, the the that inclination for justice, like in this case, respecting God's wishes, um, puts a, a sort of cap or check on the affection for advantage. So, 
what Anselm ends up doing here is giving us a whole theory of the will's freedom and moral responsibility that is grounded in these two affections, which which are by nature ordered to different formal objects. And then freedom consists in uh, the affection for advantages, uh, p- power to like prevent us from just slavishly always going toward uh, what the happiness dictate says we should go for. Yeah. So we really can, so to speak, like hold ourselves back and say, wait, 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 is that like, is that really the thing to be done? And mm-hmm. I, I, because of my affection for advantage, I have freedom here. I don't have to go for, for what seems to be most happiness promoting. Yeah. Um, um, so, so then you explain the fall, Lucifer's fall by um, having, he has these two affections. So he's, he's responsible for correctly using his affection for advantage to make sure that he's willing happiness within the limits of justice. Mm-hmm. And he chooses not to. Yeah. So now he's morally responsible for seeking that higher status that he wasn't supposed to seek. And that's what the fall, Lucifer's fall consists in. So it's yeah. a way of showing how um, a will that originally is uncorrupted by, by any sin could start going wrong. Yeah. Like you always just by nature, you your happiness drive, advantage drive, just it just is ordered for its own advantage. Yeah. And the justice drive is ordered toward justice. And we can go either way. Do we need is this um do we need libertarian free will? You know, is there a principle of alternate possibilities at play there, or or is this also compatible with a compatibilist take? I I think That and some is a libertarian. Yeah, I think I think you're right. No, I think you're right on that. Notice his too. Could we tweak it? Because you 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 probably need there to be like fifty fifty or whatever. You need like some indeterminacy yeah. probably in order to say like this is why he chose. Well, it, it's not really an explanation of why he chose advent um, affectio com- commodi instead of uh, uita whatever the latin is justice yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you probably need that otherwise you're saying well no it looks like god still gave him the desire to choose advantageous over no matter what it's like god still has to have some kind of greater reason for it you know like whether yeah. libertarian free will is a greater good or whether having uh satan in the grand story allows for you know incarnation and redemption you know we, we're still going to have to have that in there but i'm just yeah it's it's fun to think through like can we mix and match these things even though I'm I'm sure I'm and some I I'm pretty sure and some was a, would would have been a libertarian yeah yeah it's 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 a it's a really compelling I, I really like the analysis done because sometimes like I really love C S Lewis but I think Lewis when talking about uh, uh, angelic sin says like hey sometimes people fall off their bikes. For no reason it's like yeah. well I, that was not that's not super satisfying uh clive you know like <laughs> but this 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 might be just a further um explication of of how it is that someone might fall off their bike willfully yeah yeah, yeah. um dude this has been so good thanks 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 so much i'm, I'm like I, there, I have to read this again probably and there's so many things that you've opened up for me that that idea about like perhaps a transcendental argument in scotus is really getting my gears turning the book's fantastic we only covered a couple like we briefly covered a couple of chapters so folks at home like you got to grab the book for more um there's stuff about living virtuous life um i guess scotus is like responsible for the immaculate conception so if you're a protestant you're like this guy you know but if if you're a catholic you're like hey this guy great um there's a lot in there yeah, real, real quick on that. You know, I'm I'm a Catholic, and so I was, you know, I write uh, sympathetically about Scotus's yeah. treatment. But, um, you know, I, I come from a Protestant background, tons mm. of Protestant friends, and so I was also thinking, like, what what would be the way to present the doctrine in in a way that would be like least alarming to a Protestant? <laughs> <laughs> and I think the way to do that it would be to um, to show as much as possible why scotus thinks that this doctrine is actually honoring of god and christ in particular um and so and and 
Catholics, because they get so excited about Mary, don't always make make those connections, even though it's like baked into the, the theology. So, right. so yeah, I, I don't think I've said enough probably to convince any Protestant, but maybe yeah. uh, a, a Protestant could read it and say, okay, hey, they're still wrong, but uh, <laughs> at least they're thinking of Jesus. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I appreciate that. That's really good. <laughs> This is this is like yeah this is a hot topic right now. I, I try not to let anything be too like culturally relevant so that my stuff can be evergreen. But uh, the listeners will know that this is a hot topic right now in certain circles in which I run. Okay. Um, so yeah, man, this is awesome. Um, again, the the book is ordered by love: an introduction to John Dunn Scotus by Dr. Thomas M. Ward, and um, it's it's out right now, right? Yeah, it, it came out last month. Uh, okay, yeah, it's there. Could awesome. I could I also briefly say you you mentioned how uh, stoked you are on Scotus's argument for God's existence? Yeah, I, I should say that next year, um, Hackett is publishing my translation of Scotus's treatise uh, De Primo Principio, treatise nice. on the first principle, where he lays all this out, and then um, Hackett's also letting me publish a commentary alongside of it. So in That's in the same awesome. volume, so Dude, it's you like gotta come back on. That's 30,000 awesome. words of hardcore natural theology, nice. followed by as many words from me trying to unpack it all and say, you know, what it might mean. It's a really hard text, but I think super rich. And now, uh, is that is that finished? Is that already in production? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It will it will be out. That's that is it's coming, coming out. out. Yeah. Dude, yeah, awesome. yeah. So I can't Hackett, wait for that. So, so since Hackett is publishing, it should actually be affordable. So yeah, <laughs> that's even better. Put that out there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Keep an eye out for that. Awesome, man. Um, can you can you tell the audience where they can find um, your your like blogs and stuff? Yeah, well, actually, I've recently taken the blog down, but oh, um, no. go to go to my website, uh, thomasmward.com, and then uh, there's you know links to a lot of stuff. Awesome. There. Awesome. Yeah. All right, I'll I'll leave a link in the description to that and uh, a link to Ordered by Love. If you grab that from mine, uh, you will be supporting the podcast through my affiliate link. So check that out. Um, that's going to have to do it for now, folks. That This has been awesome. That's it. Uh, this has been Parker's Pensies, and as always, all glory to God.